I'm Monica Montgomery and I'm going to be introducing our fabulous, <laughs> our fabulous um, panelists this evening. But I just want to talk a little bit about why we're here and just kind of read a little bit about what this event is about. Um, artists are in demand and you don't have to be a starving artist. That is a stereotype. If you're a starving artist, you're not going to be starving after tonight. So get ready. I think that there's a lot of people in this room that are looking for mentoring, that are looking to advance their practice and figure out how can they thrive and make more and get commissions. So a lot of the people on this panel have gotten artist commissions, are artists that are thriving themselves, are arts administrators that are hiring. So definitely look to them for leadership and knowledge as the evening goes on. Well, I am going to turn it over first to Miss. Jennifer Landis, who is the Deputy Director for Public Art for the New York Parks Department. And she's going to talk to us about the process the Parks Department has and how you can get commissions through that. I oversee um, temporary public artworks that you see in the parks. There are two out front right now in process uh, with a local um, school has a lunchroom table out front as well as the synchro pianos. And we also over, uh, oversee murals. Um, which hopefully you saw kind of along the, um, along the fields out front. Um, art and Antiquities, also just so you know, we also oversee all of the permanent artwork um, in city parks. Our temporary program, we have a gallery in um, Central Park. We also oversee the city's uh, historical files. Um, I'll talk briefly about how permanent work is commissioned. Um, it's a very uh, selective process because typically permanent work, we don't accept donated works, but we do um, put new works in through the Percent for Art program, and I'll give you information on how you can add your work to the registry to be considered for uh, permanent works in the city's public spaces. So our temporary public artwork, um, those are installations that are on view for less than one year. It's a really phenomenal way for you to bring your artwork out into the public. Um, it gets people really thinking about their public spaces differently. It gets a lot of eyes on your work, but then it also it creates this um, sense of place. You know, place making is a buzzword these days, but it really does um, create ownership and interest in our public spaces. This is actually the first public artwork officially through our program, which was at the Union Square uh, Check a Child Playground, um, where you just dropped your children off like a goat, <laughs> um, and it was uh, really successful. So we continued. Um, public art, I think, can be intimidating at first because a lot of people think this has to be a large monumental bronze sculpture, and that's not the case. It can come in many different shapes and forms. Um, this piece was made out of discarded umbrellas and floated into the Inwood Hill Inlet. Um, we've done backstop uh, designs. Um, this artist created signage um, that directed people to other permanent works around the city. Um, you have monumental pieces like this. Um, but also this artist purchased hundreds of like dollar store umbrellas and painted them and we installed them in uh, Battery Park for several weeks. Um, this may be familiar to some. This was 100 Story House, which was right here at Old Stone, um, which was an actual lending library. Um, artists used um, very affordable materials. This artist used the um, safety, uh, or not safety, excuse me, privacy fencing um, that you can buy at any home goods store and reinterpreted um, designs from the Native American tribes on Randall's Island and wove them into the chain link fencing along the soccer fields. Um, this artist used a tree that fell down during Sandy. Um, and then we actually have this mural program um, in First Park that if you're, look, if you're interested in murals, they hold open calls through First Street Green, which is a nonprofit organization, um, and they do rotating murals um, about every six months. Um, we have things on land and sea. Um, this piece was hundreds of hula hoops that then kind of were uh, attached to each other to create this interior dome space that surrounded our plazas. And um, one really great thing about our program is it gives people an opportunity to also activate their artwork in partnership with other performance artists or um, other friends, um, creative friends. For example, this had a dance party every night, but it was with silent headphones before 
um, silent discos were all the rage, um, and that also made sure that they didn't have to go get an NYPD sound permit. So we, we try to work with artists to find kind of um, easiest ways about going um, through our bureaucratic process. So um, you might wonder how do you actually go about exhibiting um, in, in a public park? Um, it's a pretty fairly straightforward process. We have a rolling submission process, so if you are interested, if you submit approximately six months prior to when you would want the work to be on view, um, you would submit that information to us. You can see the website on the bottom that has this in detail. Um, we're looking for a written description of what that artwork is, um, including the dimensions, the medium, weights, um, how you plan on installing it. Um, if the artwork exists, photographs. If not, drawings or renderings are sufficient. Um, the artist statement and resume, um, the budget, just so that we can understand your capacity. Um, we're also looking for the duration. Again, it's no longer for, than a year, and we typically exhibit things, I'd say, on average, six to eight months. After the eight-month period, there's this weird psychological shift that we found that vandalism starts, uh, occurrences of vandalism increase because people no longer see it as a piece of artwork. It's like theirs at that point. Um, and location, sometimes people don't have a specific location and it's really intimidating because we have such a huge park system, we oversee um, all five boroughs. But if you have a type of a location that you're looking for, you've created a really intimate piece and you're looking for a garden setting, you can say that and we can help identify what locations might be um, possibilities for your piece. Um, things that we're looking at, one we are reviewing, um, artistic merit site suitability, um, organizational capacity, and that's just to ensure like, um, for example, if someone has never uh, proposed an artwork before, or never done an outdoor installation before, and they're proposing a 40 foot bronze sculpture, we would have concerns about their ability to uh, accomplish that. So we just wanna make sure um, that you're kind of ready to accomplish um, the, the project that's proposed. Um, we're looking for durability. Of course, any time that you put something out in a public space, people are gonna climb it, they're gonna touch it, they're gonna like really test the limits. So you're gonna wanna make sure that the materials are appropriate. Um, we get wide ranges of weather, so cold weather, hot weather, and that can um, withstand that, as well as public safety, making sure that it's structurally sound. Um, the one issue uh, hurdle for the Parks Department is we don't receive funding from the city at all. So we unfortunately can't provide funds directly to artists. Um, so these are some of the responsibilities or costs that artists are responsible for. However, there are a lot of really great grant opportunities um, here in this borough alone. Brooklyn Arts Council has been a huge supporter of exhibitors of public art in the borough. Um, the other boroughs, of course, have um, local arts councils, and there's a number of additional granting organizations um, that I can go into more detail um, in our mentoring session. Um, if you're not quite ready for large public art installations, you can get your toes wet with event programming. This is just a 30-day notice. Um, you go onto the park's website. Which, there we go. Um, on the top bar, if you submit for an event, you create an account. You submit to do a performance piece in your local park. Um, it's a $25 application fee, and then you just need 30 days notice. So it's a very easy process, and a lot of performance artists that we work with go through this method to just get an understanding. Even if you just have a sculpture that you want to install, but only for a day, you can do it through this event permit, and you don't actually have to go through our longer public art process, for that, which, are, um, which is in place for longer term exhibitions. Murals are very similar to public art. We're looking for the same exact information, and you can find all of this information online. Um, we do have stricter guidelines and uh, stricter review because murals, um, though we only permit them for a year, they do often last longer than a year, of course, and we want to ensure that it doesn't become a maintenance burden, that those are kept up um, for the duration that they're on view. So I'm going to talk um, briefly, though I work for the Parks Department, there are other phenomenal public art programs that do provide artists directly with funding for doing public art, one of which is the Department of Transportation. Um, they have annual grants of up to $8,000 for artists who partner with local nonprofit community groups. If you go to their website, they have several tracks, which I think actually you did their barrier program, yeah. which provides funding. Um, and they're a fantastic program, so that's one alternative. Um, the Department of Cultural Affairs, if you're really interested in working on a percent for art project, and so that's um, projects that occur on city-owned land, not only outdoor, like DOT plazas and parks, but also within schools, public buildings. Um, you can go onto the Department of Cultural Affairs website 
And if you go um, to the percent for art page, you'll see that there's an image registry form. You can um, fill out, it'll, it's a basic kind of artist registry. You can add your information, um, your artwork, your contact, your background, um, and it will include you within an artist registry that when they do have a project that they're looking to find an artist to work on, they go to that registry um, and they won't consider you unless you are in this registry. So this is a really phenomenal um, thing for, for artists to participate in. Also, um, though it's not officially a city agency, MTA Arts and Design have um, done amazing things with artists that we've worked with in the past. They, if you go to their parks, or excuse me, not to their parks website, to their MTA Arts and Design website, they have lists for um, open calls and other opportunities, and those are the actual installations that you see in subways or in the windows kind of of subway stops, um, and it's a really great program as well. Um, so that was my very brief, <laughs> I could go on for hours, I do like a two hour talk on this, so that was um, very quick, but if you have more, or if you want more information, you can go to this website, and this was just a really cute photo of art imitating life, imitating art, this is Tony Mattelli's bronze seeing eye dog, and just like a real dog, check Next up, we have Miss Brenda Slamani. Slamani. <laughs> Slamani, who is a painter and is going to talk with us about her experience with arts commission. Anyway, so I'm just going to go through a quick thing of my paintings and how I ended up doing commissions. I never set out to do commissions. I started painting portraits in the early 90s. And just the quick background, I came up during minimalism and feminism and Portraiture was considered white male language and girls were not really encouraged to do it. So in my first show of portraits, I painted my friends who were bald male artists. And um, it, was, it was an attempt to sort of reverse the traditional gaze of um, the man looking at the woman. And I called a lot, so not everybody was my friend, like here's a painting of Chuck Close. I called a lot of well-known artists and I would say, do you want to pose for me? And they would say, why? And I would say, because you're bald. And they would be like, Great, and so anyway, um, um, so I had this show with these 12 bald men and these 12 little birds, and I did this painting of my friend Christian Eckhart, and um, while the show was up, Janet Froehlicher from the New York Times um, contacted me and asked me if I wanted to do a portrait of Jeffrey Dahmer, and she said, just make it look like Christian, and it'll be fine for the New York Times Magazine. And so I started asking my friends, like, should I do it? Because commissions seemed like a really bad thing. Like, somehow it was creepy, was it art? And I even talked to Chuck Close about it, and he said, don't do it, because it will compromise you. But um, I was just so intrigued by the idea of painting Jeffrey Dahmer. Does everybody know who Jeffrey Dahmer is? Or Yeah. So I just thought painting somebody so evil would be really kind of fun. So I decided to not take the advice of my friends, and I did this painting of Jeffrey Dahmer. So here it is. And um, it was in the New York Times, and it was really fun. It, among the things that were fu was fun about it, it was really scary to paint him, but the thing that was fun was the pressure of having to do it in seven days. And um, you know, it, was just, it was an interesting experience. And then I continued to work with the New York Times Magazine and would occasionally get commissions from them, but they always gave me the evil people. Um, <laughs> I don't know why, but um, I got to paint Marian Anderson, so I got to paint one nice person. But um, I did um, Osama bin Laden for the cover of the Times Magazine and New York Times Magazine, and um, that was for the 9/11 like 10 year anniversary, and um, that was an interesting. I mean, and so anyway, it's commissions have been pretty good in that sense because like um, how it. I mean, the kind of publicity you get on the cover of a New York Times magazine, it, I mean, it's really, it doesn't get any better than that. Like, it's so much, it's on everybody. This came out, for, I think, um, I, well, I think, it, I can't remember the day it came out, but it was on everybody's coffee ta table all over the world for a while. And I even had to not take <coughs> phone calls because there was some, you know, there was some controversy of, about the painting. So anyway, so, Moving on, so the question is, do, um, are you compromised when you're doing commissions? And I, because I kept getting commissions after I had this show. And um, when I started thinking about the best portraits in the history of art, the truth is, by and large, they are commissioned. And I, so I think my thought is, it doesn't matter if you are paid for a painting before 
after, during, or never. If a painting is great, it's great, and if it's not, it's not. And it has nothing to do with how it came about. And I think the best um, commissioned portraits in the history of art manage to be acceptable to their subject while critiquing the subject at the same time. And um, it's, that's something that has always been really fascinating to me. Like, can you, um, can you um, have a separate agenda going on while your subject is accepting the portrait? And so, I'll, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit in my work. So this, is, this guy's name is Fred Woolworth. Do people know about Woolworth's department store? Like, he's a billionaire. and his younger wife commissioned this portrait of him. And I had seen this Lucian Freud of Lee Bowery and I was really interested in painting a lot of flesh. And um, he wanted to keep his glasses on and um, I told him he could only keep them on if other stuff came off. And, um, <laughs> and so I think this is an example of a painting where um, I'm critiquing the subject but I'm also flattering him, him enough so that I got paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> and it was a great, I mean, it was a great opportunity for me because I had only painted heads. I hadn't ventured into bodies yet, and he had such a great body. So, uh, that's Fred. And then, um, this is another commissioned portrait. I, I was only painting men, and a collector approached me to do a self-portrait. And I wasn't really interested in painting women, and I certainly didn't want to look in the mirror. So, um, this was, I mean, this is an example of where, um, a commissioned portrait will take you somewhere that you didn't want to go. And I've been doing a self-portrait every other year since then. So a self, sometimes a commission can be useful to um, advance your own ideas. Um, and then I've had a lot of commissions where somebody likes my work and they'll say, we just want anything you want to paint. Um, would you paint an artist in our collection? So a Warhol collector um, commissioned this painting. and. A Basquiat collector commissioned this one. Um, <coughs> another way that I've gotten commissions, well, the way I usually gotten commissions is I, I haven't, there's only one example I'll show you in the end where I tried to get something because I really wanted it, but this painting was at the National Portrait Gallery and the World Bank is, is located really close to there. So the curator from the World Bank um, wanted a painting of the retiring head of the World Bank, James D. Wolfenson. So she had gone over and seen it at the portrait gallery and contacted me to do the painting. And um, they had never had a woman painter, so that was a really cool thing. Here's Mr. Wolfenson. And this was an interesting commission. Usually I try to get carte blanche, on, and I usually do. I don't always. But the only thing she wanted for this was the Mona Lisa smile <laughs> on his face. So here you can see the smile. And here you can see I kind. this is what he really looks like. And, and there it is, I put it on there. Um, and I, I had it on the, on the she, they didn't see any photos or any sketches. They just said, make sure that Mona Lisa smile is on there. So I was like, okay, whatever. And then, um, <laughs> and then um, his wife said the most interesting and sort of slightly upsetting thing I've ever heard as a painter. She came up to me, um, they, they didn't see it, it was in velvet and it was unveiled and he saw it for the first time at the unveiling in front of an audience with like a couple hundred people, which I think was really scary for him. Mm -hmm. But then his wife came up to me and said, um, you painted the man I wish I had married. Oh. And I just thought, whoa, <laughs> what does that mean? Because <laughs> I think um, in a commissioned portrait, I mean, you're in charge of somebody's mortality because, I mean, everybody's going to die and the portraits will live forever. And so it's a big deal what you do with it. It's an honor and it's a privilege, but it's a risk for the subject. Um, anyway, um, so I just want to um, talk about families a little. I think that I've done a couple of families. Families are really tricky because you're painting individuals and you're trying to get their psychology, but you're also painting the dynamics in the family, which can often be so um, fraught. Um, this is a painting by Goya, and apparently he intended this painting as a critique of um, Char King Charles IV's family, and I think you can see it. Um, this is my painting of um, Jonathan O'Hara's family, and I'm not gonna tell you everything about them, but I'll just tell you a few things. Um, she, the woman in the middle is the mom, Aunt Mandy, and she, no matter what, I could not get her face 
to be satisfactory to her. She kept saying, I don't look happy, I don't look happy. And I kept repainting it and repainting it. And he's got his cats and he's looking off in the distance and those are the cats that she doesn't even like. And, <laughs> and anyway, I finally finished the painting. This is a seven foot painting and two weeks later they filed for divorce. So somehow the painting predicted um, that things were not going that well and no matter what I did, I couldn't make a happy family there. And um, he just remarried and commissioned another family portrait. <laughs> and I did it as a grid where each panel is separate so you can take out <laughs> the wife. And, um, because I wasn't going to take that risk again. Because this painting's in storage now. And it won't be coming out. <laughs> and then um, sometimes in a, there's another kind of agenda. Like in this situation, um, the boy in the middle um, was killed in the Gulf War. And these are his dads. And, they approached me, they were collectors who knew my work and they approached me because they wanted the painting um, for, for closure and for healing. And in a situation like this, I had to get very involved with the family, like fly out to California and like sleep in the kids' bedroom and look at all the videos. And it was this really intensely bonding thing. And I was pregnant at the time and they ended up be becoming co-parents of my daughter because it was such a close and special thing. So, um, so that's Justin in the middle. And I didn't know, I mean, I sometimes feel like when you're painting portraits, or at least when I'm painting them, I'm like a lightning painting them. I can channel things. And I didn't know that he died by fire, um, but I came up with these colors to represent their personalities. And then later on when his parents saw the painting, they said, oh, did you know that Justin died in a helicopter accident and he burned? And so that was like really kind of, intense for me. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's even hard for me to talk about it because I feel like he's my family. But anyway, so that's Justin. And okay, and then I'm just gonna, this is the Duchess of Alba. This, it's a Goya painting. And I had this commission recently from Educational Testing Service of Kurt Landgraf. And he's just a guy in a suit. And I just thought, wow, this is gonna be really boring. <laughs> How am I gonna make this art? So I told him, well, and, and I spent the day photographing him and drawing him. and. I couldn't get an image, I was going crazy with it. And then finally I went to his house and he's, his little dog came out to greet him and he came to life. And I thought, wow, this dog is gonna be key. So I asked the people who were commissioning if the dog could be in the painting and they said no. So um, I just thought, oh wow, that's really gonna be a drag. Cause I don't wanna do a portrait if it's not art um, to me. So I decided to just take the risk and do it as a diptych, oops, and do it as a diptych. So I just did the dog, and when I delivered the painting, a whole building was built in his honor, so I was working with the architect and the colors and stuff. I just delivered the dog and said, the dog is part of it, and you can hang it or not hang it, but this is the way I see it. And then they loved the dog, and they hung it, but the interesting thing is, like, if you just take away the dog and just look at the man, I mean, it's just a kind of um, man in a suit. But somehow the dog having that stance, the two of them together, I think gives it more psychological depth and it, it, um, it's humorous, it's a kind of critique in the same way that with the Duchess of Alba, something about that little dog with his little red bow, like the content, the psychological content lies in between the pet and the person. So I got to, um, I mean this was where I was really threading that line training that line of like not being able to paint what I wanted to paint, but I got to paint it. And so that was really, um, I, I felt really happy about that. Um, and this is, I, there's also these other portraits that you do or commissions and where you do something you've never done before, like the self-portrait, and you don't really think you can. So I'm, I'm not a background person. I only like to paint the thing, but I don't like to paint the stuff. And I went out to California because this, this commission portrait involved um, this woman, Anne, in her garden. And I just did it um, as a challenge, but I was, I was really like, pretty afraid of doing it because I don't like extra stuff. And um, it, it worked out pretty well. And so then I was um, in California visiting with David Hockney and he was in his garden with his iPad and I decided to do this painting, but I would have never done this painting, which is in the National Portrait Gallery now, if I hadn't done the commission, because I wouldn't have felt that I could have painted plants, because um, I'm really not a plant person. So, that, so that's kind of interesting how you can use a commission to take you to the next level. So um, 
that's something to pay to not you know to not say no to things um, because you might grow. Um, and then this is the only painting I ever applied for, and I so I because all of my commissions have been like accidents based on what's hanging and somebody seeing it. But this was a competition at Yale, and I really wanted to paint this painting, so I applied for it. And this is the drawing that I competed with. They had a call where people just submitted slides of previous work, and then they picked five people to draw. And I actually don't draw at all, and I certainly, this is a seven foot drawing, and I don't draw like this. And I really wanted to win so badly that I spent like a month drawing this drawing for like unbelievably low pay. Um, but I thought I had a pretty good chance, and I did win, and this is the finished painting. And um, this is it hanging in the situation, so. Um, it, and it was just, that was, to me, that was about a personal debt to the school that I wanted to do the project. So um, I was happy, <coughs> happy with that. So that's, anyway, that's it. So you can see from this um, backside of my postcard here um, that pretty much what I do is I um, go to a party and I paint a scene from that party, um, which guests can kind of watch take shape um, throughout the party. And then um, I'll take the painting home, do a few touch-ups to it, and then deliver it to the client, and they get this kind of special memory of their wedding or special event that they can keep forever. Mm -hmm. And typically uh, I'll do like a first dance for a wedding, but I also do ceremonies, um, done cake cuttings, bar and bat mitzvahs, kids parties, corporate events. Um, people will send me photos and I'll do paintings from those. Um, I typically do about two or three of these events on the weekends mostly during the busy season, um, a little bit less in the winter. Um, and then during the week, I pretty much work on the touch-ups and the photo commissions and then of course, make time for the creative work that I do here at the Oldstone House and other places. Um, and I can definitely talk later in this discussion about like the challenges of balancing all of it, but I do really feel grateful for the flexibility that this gives me because my weekdays are usually pretty, pretty open um, and then working for myself, I can kind of pick and choose the jobs that I want to take on. Um, and I think that if you can maintain this kind of flexibility, with your work, um, that the wedding and event industry is actually can be a great way to support yourself financially as an artist, because especially here in the New York City region, people are spending on average between thirty and eighty-eight thousand dollars on their weddings, and really actually wanting that budget to include something truly unique, i.e., by an artist that can kind of set their event apart, especially if it's like something they get to keep forever and you know share on Pinterest and Facebook and everything. Um, so my trajectory into live event painting is actually a very gradual process, um, and a lot of it really was sheer luck, I think. But in hearing my story, I hope that you can also take away the importance of um, having a quality artistic product and developing that, um, putting yourself out there in your work, and then especially recognizing and seizing unexpected opportunities when they come up, and then really importantly, staying true to yourself. So my very first wedding painting in 2008 actually resulted you know, kind of by accident um, from someone reaching out to me when they saw my you know, cityscape and landscape paintings in the uh, Brooklyn Arts Council online registry. Uh, like Jenny pointed out, um, the registries, these free registries by organizations like BRIC and, and Brooklyn Arts Council are a really great way to get your work out there. Um, you might actually get discovered by people who will approach you to do things you never would have thought about doing yourself, like painting someone's weddings. Um, so also it's important to keep your, to put that work on your website and keep your website up to date. Um, because I had you know, put this original painting on my website and that actually led to some sporadic um, additional wedding commissions over the next two years, like this one. Um, and then I decided to really kind of seize the opportunity and um, start building up my portfolio a little more like through gifting paintings to friends and family and then accepting an offer um, to advertise in a luxury wedding blog that had its own distinct section for live event painting that came up really quickly in Google searches so that I could increase my online traffic. And that led to about uh, getting about a dozen or two jobs a year in 2011 and 2012. But again, uh, luck kind of played into getting where I am today, where I'm really doing this full time, um, because the New York Times decided to do a feature on live event artists in 2012. Um, they featured this painting of mine in their slideshow. And um, after that exposure, the business you know, literally tripled the following year and then kind of just continued to grow after that to the extent where it actually made financial sense to quit my full-time job in arts administration in 2014 so I could just do as many of these paintings as possible, essentially. But um, I think along with kind of being in the right place in the right time to get this coverage, um, I think the Times and their readers um, sort of chose, out, chose to reach out to me um, 
because all the while I had really been working to kind of improve the nature of the paintings themselves by you know, studying and connecting with other artists in the field, um, one of whom I think actually referred me to the Times reporter, um, and then really paying attention to what my clients seem to want in their paintings. This painting here kind of reflects the development of my more mature style, or I, I usually paint the background and the crowd and everything as much as possible from life, but then the people that they really want emphasized in the painting, you know, the bride and groom, the family, I usually take photo references and work from those photos throughout the event to get like the level of detail um, in the people that you see here. Um, and I've also developed a process of um, kind of doing pre-consultations uh, with my clients to see um, what's really important for them for the paintings, um, get their preferences in advance so I don't have to make too many revisions to the paintings afterwards. You know, for example, not only asking which people they want featured, but if it matters where, where they are in the painting and what they're doing, um, do they want something more like a you know, beautiful single moment and decorations captured versus like a party really lively and full swing. Um, I've realized I should avoid certain things like putting ugly DJ equipment in the painting or <laughs> blocking the dance floor and the views of people with like a big I don't know, column or a table or something like that. Um, so that's really limited the amount of revisions that I, I usually have to do. But um, in short, I really do consider these paintings very much collaborations with my clients as opposed to someone commissioning me to just kind of do my creative thing in, in their space, you know, like some of those parks projects, for example. So if you're considering commissions, you want to really establish like where on the spectrum you feel most comfortable. And then the contracts that you make with your clients, because you should always have a contract, um, need to clearly outline things like what is expected of the client in the, con in the uh, planning process, um, what kinds of revisions you're willing to do, and how that affects the price, and all of that. And then just some really quick notes on um, what's been helpful to me in terms of marketing and promotion. Um, two years ago, I hired a designer to create this uh, website, a new website template for me and a logo, and that was a great investment. Um, in addition to having compelling portfolio images on your site right, right off the bat, um, I also rely heavily on my um, FAQ page and my contact page so that my clients and I can kind of get really comprehensive um, information about each other up front and make the whole process more efficient. Um, also, I don't do a lot of paid advertising, to be honest, at this point, but I do find having a profile on a site like Wedding Wire, where um, clients are going to search for vendors and want to see good reviews, um, I find that to be really helpful. And for their members, they also have things like free webinars and events where I can network with other professionals and really learn about the industry, which I didn't know a lot about before. Um, a lot of my business really just comes from word of mouth and from social media. Um, so when I go to events, I always put my business cards out, I network with the other vendors and um, you know, event planners I meet there and have good relationships with them, but I also post everything on Instagram right after the wedding. I, I face the Facebook, I, do, I use um, related hashtags, um, location tags, tag other vendors, so a lot of times my work gets shared and people you know, literally contact me having found me on, on Instagram or Facebook. Um, just really quickly, a few other examples of creative things I've seen other artists doing in the wedding industry or event industry. Um, of course, there's always a high demand for video and photo, but I've also seen really cool things like you know, watercolor paintings of bouquets or dress sketches, um, illustrated love stories of the couple, um, customized ceramic cake toppers, um, hand-drawn chalk signs, um, paper creations for the table numbers. So there's, I, in short, I think there's really, um, it's a really interesting industry um, to get involved with that can give you, you know, help support your arts career, but also I think really um, bring a lot of joy to other people's lives, so. Chris Thoria, <laughs> who is a painter, muralist, and co-founder of Maniac Pumpkin Carvers. I can't wait to see what this is about. Uh, I also wear several different hats um, as a creative. Um, I'm sharing two tonight uh, because they comprise most of my, uh, my work year. Um, nine out of 12 of the months of the year, uh, I'm mostly nowadays working on murals. Um, I've been making murals since I, I was a teenager in some form, but the uh, field of mural making kind of also fell in my lap um, a little bit. I graduated from Parsons in 2002 in illustration, and uh, I had it in mind that I was gonna be a commercial illustrator, and you know, do editorial illustration, advertising illustration, and I graduated, and there wasn't much of a field for it. So um, I was dabbling in doing a little bit of illustration, some commissions, and then working in the service industry, 
in New York City for about 10 years, uh, which upon reflection today and being on this panel, I actually think working in the service industry actually uh, contributed positively to my art, art career and uh, working with people. Uh, it's not the same thing as serving tables, but doing commissions and working for people um, requires you to have some people skills and you're also providing a service for somebody. So I think it lent itself well to it. Um, uh, this mural is from, I have a series of slides spanning past uh, about almost 10 years. Um, somewhat chronological order, I think this was uh, a mural that I did in 2008. Um, and it was, uh, I had already been doing um, public murals on uh, store, on small murals on stores and, and restaurants throughout the city. Um, and this was kind of my first public initiative. It was uh, through Brooklyn Public Arts Coalition along industry in Greenpoint. Um, and they partnered up with Groundswell that helped provide the logistics. This wasn't a Groundswell project. Um, they had a call for entries for six artists that each painted a mural uh, along India Street by the waterfront on a building that's no longer there. Um, and this is the mural that I did. It's uh, called Antiquated Giant. And it was kind of a celebration of uh, the history of the Greenpoint Terminal Market and the manu or American Manufacturing Company in Greenpoint, um, which burned down in 2007. Um, and through this mural, uh, I was introduced to Groundswell, who then brought me on board as an arts educator, um, doing murals throughout the city. Uh, this is a Groundswell mural in Red Hook at Valentino Pier. Uh, Groundswell is an no arts nonprofit uh, located n uh, nearby in Gowanus, and they've produced, been around for about 16 or 17 years, um, and have produced about uh, seven or 800 murals throughout the five boroughs. Um, Groundswell works with youth, they work with um, artists. Uh, they usually have about 30 or so artists on their roster, um, all practicing independent contractors, uh, who then work with youth on a, a variety of projects and a variety of themes that usually involve some form of social justice. Um, this was a, a mural through their uh, summer mural project, which is through July, it's July and August, and uh, the artists work with the kids to come up with brainstorming, come up with ideas, and then uh, actually fabricate the mural at various locations throughout the, throughout the city. Um, I also still do murals just for the sake of doing murals and, and find interesting locations and places to go. This is a mural in Calcutta, India that I did in um, 2014, I believe, 2014. Um, and this was... Uh, this was this, uh, the same month that there was a famous rape case in, in New Delhi that was uh, very worldwide publicized and uh, me and a friend of mine wanted to do a mural that lent itself to the celebration of uh, women from various cultures, various backgrounds, various castes in India and uh, we, we painted this one with house paint and uh, bamboo scaffolding so that was an interesting experience. Um, this is a, a Groundswell mural in, in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Um, and then uh, I still take on commissions of my own. This is a mural commission at a restaurant called Lout on 17th Street between um, 5th and Broadway, Malaysian restaurant. Uh, this is the same restaurant. Um, and I do, uh, I still do mural commissions for, for homes, lobbies, restaurants. Um, and similarly, I also, with my mural commissions, um, I certainly try to infuse uh, my own personal aesthetics and styles in what I'm doing um, and I ha although I have several and have been uh, blending a few different styles and aesthetics in my work um, they have there has been kind of a branding of my work uh, and stylization of my murals over time including sacred geometry and tessellation and uh, somewhat uh, psychedelic spiritual work um, this is at a restaurant called Pasar Malam in Williamsburg, um, and then I still do murals throughout the city uh, on my own that has, have no client, I get you know permission um, to paint on the walls. This is a collaboration, this is in Bushwick, collaboration that I did with um, Joel Bergner, and I, uh, thinking about art as a practice, um, I think that my most, uh, my most impactful moments in practicing have always been in a collaborative sense where I was actually you know, working with other artists or working with other parties um, collaboratively and, and those experiences have always 
helped me grow as an artist and I think have lent themselves positively to um, the advancement of my career. This is another piece that I did on my own in Brooklyn. Um, this is a canvas commission of Julian Assange, not for Julian Assange, but it's of Julian Assange. Uh, mural, uh, I do the Art Basel scene every year in, in Miami and Wynwood. Um, and have painted everything from skateboards to umbrellas to pianos also for uh, Sing for Hope, which I did um, not this year. Sing for Hope is another arts nonprofit that has places pianos all over the city. I believe it's going on right now, right? Yep. It's going on they right. They were installed yesterday and today. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really cool project. Um, in the past, they had 88 pianos throughout the five boroughs in 88 different locations that were all public and you can play them and they had a lot of accomplished pianists and musicians play them and then they have people who don't know how to play piano play them and they're open to the public and I had uh, I had my I painted baby grand pianos each time which was is pretty sweet fun to paint a baby grand and uh, the first year I painted for Sing for Hope my piano was located at Lincoln Center um, in front of Juilliard and the second time I painted for Sing for Hope, my piano's located at JFK, so they were, they were both pretty cool locations. Um, this is another Groundswell mural that is in the lobby, or in the cafe for an organization called Year Up um, in downtown Manhattan. Um, this was a mural that I did with a friend of mine named Misha Tatunik in Norfolk, Virginia for the Neon Arts Festival. Um, this is at the 21st Precinct. Uh, group art show of graffiti and street art in 2014 um, and then I have a studio practice of, of course where I do uh, anything from portrait commissions to abstract commissions to um, all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, this is a mural that I did at Livestream uh, offices recently in, um, in Bushwick and uh, the Livestream offices are the old third ward and actually it's in Williamsburg. Um, this is the old third ward and they've recently started creating murals throughout the entire office. Um, yeah, so that's a little glimpse of my mural work. Miss Ariane Hunter, who is a photographer and creative career coach. So my name is Ariane, I'm a career and business coach for creative professionals. Um, I'll get into a little bit about how I um, fell into this, uh, this profession, um, but it wasn't by one day waking up saying I'm going to be a coach one day, it just sort of happened. Um, my career path has been sort of a squiggly line as opposed to a straight path. Um, maybe some of you can relate to that, but um, as, it, as it is now, I work with career professionals to sort of transition them into work that they love. Um, one of the reasons why this is so uh, passionate and near and dear to my heart is that I believe that each and every one of us is here for a reason. Um, I believe that each of us has a gift to share, however you want to share that gift, and it's our responsibility to find out what that is. Um, so I made it my mission to help people understand what that is for them and help them to bring that out into the world in a bigger way. So some of the areas in which I work with my uh, individual clients is obviously making the transition from a corporate job to a full-time creative entrepreneur. Um, so it's not just enough to dream about it, you have to do it, right? So what are sort of the, the nitty-gritty details of the action plans to, to make it become a reality? Um, marketing yourself as a professional, right? What is your unique signature strength that makes you stand out as an artist, right? Selling your work, and we'll talk a little bit later about what that means. Um, I believe that we don't actually sell our work, we sell ourselves. Um, and creative confidence, this is a big one. Um, you wouldn't believe um, the amount of clients that I get to work with that um, the number one thing that stops us is fear, right? Confidence and being, putting ourselves out there, right? So we'll get a little bit into that um, later on in the presentation. So how I first came into this work was, as I said earlier, is sort of a squiggly line as opposed to a straight path. So um, I don't know if how many of you can relate to this, but I sort of was brought up in a household of you get the degree, you get the job, make lots of money, and live happily ever after, right? Can anybody relate to that? I'm not the only one, right? <laughs> okay, maybe. Um, so I did those things. I checked my boxes. Um, I got the business degree, got a fancy job, and thought the happiness would come, only it didn't. Um, so uh, I found myself in a role that I was not fulfilled in, sort of looking outside of the window of my office, um, kind of looking at 
um, the ground below me and um, seeing all the people that were kind of rushing you know, to work and realized that I had just done this the day before and the day before and the day before and that had become my life, that had become my, my, my career. Um, and I wasn't happy. So um, you know, I asked myself, is this all there is? Um, so right around that time, I started to under realize that I didn't really know myself, right? I did all the things that I thought I was supposed to do and checked my boxes, but I really didn't get a chance to understand what it is that I love truly. Um, so that's why creativity actually is so, so, so important to me. And um, it was one of the things that really helped me to connect with myself as a person. Um, photography. Photography um, happened to be um, something that I just picked up. It wasn't something that I learned as a child. Um, it was kind of, kind of um, later on in life, I picked it up as a hobby. Um, and really it developed into a strong passion. Um, it connected me to my sense of self and how I saw the world. Um, I remember taking um, a photograph of uh, a winter storm. It was the day after a winter storm, and um, it was early in the morning, and it, the, the snow was uninterrupted, no um, footsteps or anything um, in the snow. And I took a picture of it, and I looked at this image, and I said, wow, you know, this is how I saw the world, right? So at that moment, I realized that what else don't I know about myself? You know, how, you know this is how I saw the world, but what else am I missing? What else is it that I don't know? Um, so that started me on sort of a personal self-discovery mission to understand a little bit more about who I was as a person and how I saw the world. Um, is there any photographers in the room? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, awesome. Um, so I believe if I give every one of you a camera, right, and ask you to photograph this glass right here, we'll have several different pictures of this glass, right? And there's something so fascinating about that to me is that the way we see the world is so uniquely different and it varies from one person to the next, right? So it's sort of understanding what, what our differences are, how we see the world and how we make that connection to our environment. Um, so as I said, photography, I kind of picked it up in, uh, as a hobby and it developed into a passion and I started developing a portfolio. People started to notice my work. And I landed my first client, maybe about, maybe under a year after picking up uh, the camera. Um, so what started out as my first client, um, I believe it was like a family portraiture session, um, developed into moonlighting as a photographer on the evenings and weekends. Um, so I thought to myself, wow, you know, I'm really enjoying this. I'm kind of good at it. Um, and I thought, you know, what if I turned this into a business? So. I, I continued to, um, to develop my passion for photography, started working with clients, but really didn't take it seriously as a business um, until the departure from corporate America. Um, I scratch out the word escape because I wish I could sit here and tell you that I courageously up and left my job and became a full-time photographer, gonna do this thing, but no, I was laid off. Um, so it was at that moment where I was sort of at a career crossroads, and maybe you can relate to this, where um, you can make a decision of you can continue doing what you've always done, knowing that you're not so happy in it, or you can take a chance on your dreams. So I decided to take a chance. Um, I had no formal training, training as an artist. Um, I took the plunge. Um, I dabbled, you know, in different um, schools of photography. Um, I picked up courses here and there, but mostly it was just me doing trial and error and, and pr in pretty much putting myself out there and learning um, as I went along. Um, and that last bullet, bullet hustle hard, <laughs> okay? Um, you know, letting people know who you are as an artist, as a photographer. Um, I made it my business to let everyone know that this is what I was doing now. Um, so naturally with that, you know, you'll meet with some sort of, um, you know, a little confusion with the people around you um, that sort of know you from a different world and now you're doing this new thing. So you kind of have to explain it to them. Um, so that was sort of um, my struggle in saying, yeah, I, you know, I studied in business, but I'm doing this photography thing now. Can you support me? Um, but knowing how strongly I believed in it and how much I loved it um, was a feeling that I never had before, so I, I just followed that feeling. Um, so for about four years, I developed my portfolio, continued to take on clients, worked as a wedding and portrait photographer. This is um, some samples of my work over the years. Um, it's, you know, I, I heard some of the panelists say, um, 
just by luck, you know, sometimes we, we land great opportunities, but I, I'm a big believer in creating those opportunities. We are all creators and artists, right? Um, so imagine we took that same intention of creating the career and the business that we love, right? So, um, so that I feel that putting myself out there and for all of us putting ourselves out there, um, taking a claim and stand for the work that you do, um, it naturally sort of opens up new opportunities to you. You start to meet people that can support you on your journey. Um, and that's exactly what happened to me when I um, decided to do this full time. Um, so my work as a full time photographer, this is sort of, um, a, a gist of how I made it work for me. Um, so I built a community from scratch. So um, I discovered blogging, contests, confidence workshops, things that I actually enjoyed doing. So um, one of the things, I don't have it here, but um, one of the things I created was a street portrait um, photography challenge. And what that was was it, it, it helped other photographers to develop their confidence. So a lot of the things that I was hearing from other fellow photographers is that it's hard to kind of put yourself out there and approach people and do, you know, um, do photos and portraits of them. So I wanted to help people overcome that fear. So I developed a, a workshop to help you do just that. So um, what it entailed was me going out to um, Union Square Park inviting a few of my fellow photographers to come along with me and to just approach strangers and ask to take their portraits of them. Um, so this is something that I did on my own and it worked so well. I, I asked about 12 people and got 10 yeses, um, but, you know, total strangers in New York City, right? Um, to, to say yes to me taking a photo of them. So it wasn't so much about the photo for me, but it was about overcoming that fear. Um, and because it worked so well, I invited out other photographers to do it with me, and that was a success. Um, and that led to other opportunities for me to develop work. And people that I approached off the street, um, I, get, you know, I got to give them their, my card, and you know, opportunities developed from that. Um, expanding my, my network, so again, putting yourself out there. Um, working with local photographers, um, letting them know what you do, um, studying under the best uh, photographers in their field. Um, that was sort of my way, of, since I was kind of late in the game as a photographer, um, that was my way of ramping up and really um, you know, um, developing my portfolio. And again, hustling. <laughs> um, so, so now, um, sort of the transition from photography to what I do now in career coaching, um, I realized sort of my bigger purpose of wanting to help other individuals do exactly what I did. So whether it's photography or uh, fine art or jewelry making or just becoming an entrepreneur, I help people to sort of discover what their big purpose is and understand not only what it is that you want to do, but what is it that you want to contribute in the world. Um, I think our careers and our businesses are the best way for, our, for us to contribute our work and actually live a, leave a legacy behind. So it's sort of asking yourself, what is the contribution that I want to make in this world? What do you want to be able to say about the life that you led and the art that you put out into the world? So I help people to understand and get clarity around what that is for them. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I'll share a little bit about um, building your creative business and what I think um, it takes for you to do that successfully. Um, so be, being a walking billboard for your work. Right? So you're always on, always sharing your work with other people, connecting with people, understanding um, what it is that they need, what it is that they want. Um, being your own self-advocate, you know, and I know it's sometimes it feels a little uncomfortable to talk about yourself and about your work, but nobody's going to know what you do unless you, you actually share that and, and put yourself out there. Um, don't be afraid to take risks, right? So we talked about starving artists um, in the beginning of the panel. Um, you know, let's not be afraid to redefine that. You know, or redefine what that means for you it does not mean that we have to eat ramen noodles just because we choose to be a, an, an artist, right? Um, so really learn to, to take risks and be comfortable with that. Um, constantly build your portfolio. Set aside time for that. Um, a lot of clients that I work with, um, sometimes it's all about the hustle, right? It's all, all about building the business and we don't make time for, for ourselves and creative projects that we love to do. Um, so make it a point to actually reserve time for yourself, whether it's half an hour a week or, um, or, or whatever, whatever it is that you can do in your schedule to, to continue building in a portfolio and create projects for yourself that do light you up. Um, remember to sell yourself, not your work, right? So 
In my work as a photographer, um, one of the things that I, I learned from working with my clients is that they didn't really hire me for my photographs. They hired me for me, you know, and that's not me tooting my own horn, it's just me showing up as me um, and not being afraid to do that. Um, people do business with people that they trust and that they like. So don't be afraid to let your sense of humor out. Don't be afraid to ask the challenging questions. Don't be afraid to, to, to really just be yourself and be authentic in everything that you do. Um, because again, you're selling yourself and not your work. Um, wearing your artist hat versus your business hat. Um, knowing your numbers. Um, so. One of the things about business school, I'm mean, so grateful that I had that background, is that you know I could be able to um, wear the artist hat and sort of creatively express myself, um, but also be grounded in the numbers. Um, so if numbers scare you, <laughs> like they did for me, um, you know how much income you have to make, your expenses, having a contract in place, we mentioned that, um, you know, understanding what your numbers are so that you can make a living at this and not being afraid to look, take a hard look at those. Um, grit, resilience, and love for the work. Keep showing up. There's, there's so many things that'll knock you off your path and derail you. Um, they're there for a reason, you know, to kind of test how much, how badly you want it. Um, so keep showing up, keep putting yourself out there. Um, every time you get knocked down, it's building, building your muscle for, for failure and disappointment because it will happen. Um, and I'm sure we've been through it before, but again, keep showing up and it will pay off in the end. What we learned today and all that came out of it, one thing that you said, Ariane, that really struck with me is that people do business with those they know, like, and trust. From pumpkin carving to photography, portrait painting to live event painting, artists are creating and working and thriving. Tonight we've heard from a diverse array of creatives and arts administrators that are hustling hard and making it happen, promoting their talent and staking a claim, making a great living in the process. Can these artists strike a balance between including community, Large commissions and maintaining artistic vision, they can. Can you be successful creatives for hire and support your thriving artistic practice? You can. We want to thank our generous sponsors of the Old Stone House, El Naya and Museum Hue, a people-powered collective advancing people of color in arts, culture, and museums. We appreciate Ms. Catherine Gressel, the producer of this event, and for producing this public program and give us all a voice.